For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest's body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. And Charles Kirsch. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, Richard. It's such an honor. Yes, to I want to begin by saying I celebrate you, Charles. Uh, you and I were very, very fortunate and are very fortunate because uh, Susan Schulman, who we are celebrating today, uh, was a friend to both of us. Yes. Uh, as she was a friend to many people. Uh, we, unfortunately, I'm not going to say that we lost her because she is very much a part of our lives. She is very much uh, with us. She's in our hearts and she will never leave us. Her legacy, you can see some of the posters uh, in the background here, are, are very much a part of our Broadway history, what she's done with us. Um, a few weeks ago, I went to Charles's uh, Facebook page because I was going to reach out to Charles to be one of my mystery guests on one of my upcoming shows. And I was floored to see your post, Charles, uh, announcing that Susan had passed away, okay. which came as a huge shock because I had no idea until I saw your post. Uh, and then I reached out to you, of course, and you then asked if I would do a celebration of her life and career and uh, and her body of worth, as I always call it. And I said, only if you'll do it with me. And you said, absolutely. So we've joined forces. And today, in addition to streaming on my own platform, we are streaming live on your YouTube channel and on your YouTube uh, Facebook page as well. So thank you, Charles, for all that you do for our community. Uh, you're the next generation and I applaud you. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining me and helping to celebrate this wonderful person. I have to just say, I was equally floored to see the news when I did for the first time, which was just scrolling through Broadway World, as I like to do multiple times a day. And I, it was so sad and, and shocking because of course, I think something that a lot of us share is we didn't know that anything was happening and, and that she was sick. and it came as such a shock and a surprise, but I'm glad that we're able to celebrate her memory like this. And I like to think that she would be happy that we're doing something like this. I think so. I want to begin by, how did you meet Susan? Well, I actually knew of Susan Shulman before I knew her. I happened to be at the drama bookshop one day with my grandmother and I was looking through the selection of books and the one that most stuck out to me was Backstage Pass to Broadway. I liked the title, I liked the idea of having a backstage pass to Broadway, and I liked the image on the cover. So of course I bought the book and then I began to do a little thing where my grandparents and I would read parts of it out loud to each other. And it was of course a very entertaining book. And I got to know Susan's journey from Hunter High School to NYU to Company to Follies and later on to Dream and State Fair. And of course I immediately sort of fell in love with this fascinating theatrical figure that she was. And I was able to meet her finally by chance at a book signing at Barnes and Noble. And I recognized her and went up to her and we immediately bonded over our shared experience of attending Hunter College High School, which I do now and she did then. And she was generous and kind right from the beginning. And we struck up an email acquaintance at first and we were supposed to always meet for lunch in person and then COVID hit and unfortunately it never happened. But we did Zoom right at the beginning of COVID and then when I started my podcast in around August, she was one of the first people who I asked and she was kind enough to say yes. And we spent almost four hours together over two parts of an interview, which made me feel much closer to her. And I was very grateful for that. Well, I, I want to say that when I first started uh, in the world of cabaret 150 years ago, I think before you were born, uh, <laughs> I actually reached out to Susan uh, to uh, because I was looking for a publicist. Uh, I couldn't afford her at the time. Uh, but that didn't matter to her because she opened her arms. She made connections. She found somebody that I could afford. Uh, oh. But she, she came to my shows. Uh, she would always help find and fill those audiences. Uh, I'm going to share a, a, a clip before we bring our first guest on uh, because... Uh, yeah, a dear friend of both of us, uh, Jason Gras, 
uh, could not be here. Uh, but he sums it up as well because she was always out there beating the drums uh, for everybody that she knew, whether she was actively involved in that production or not. Uh, she was there for all of us. Uh, so this is Jason Graw. Uh, I got this this morning and, uh, and then we'll bring on our first guest and I'll let you introduce our first guest. Hey everybody, Jason Graw here. I'm in Los Angeles in my car during rush hour. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm so sorry that I, I couldn't be with you in person, Richard, to um, and Charles, to pay tribute to our beloved Susan Shulman. Uh, I just loved her and I'm just, oh, I, I miss her every day and I haven't seen her since before lockdown. Um, but we certainly would keep in touch on social media and emails. And uh, I got to work with her a lot. She would, uh, she worked with me when I was doing club acts at the Lori Beachman at Birdland and, and other places when I was out here in Los Angeles and I couldn't drum up business in New York. So she helped, you know, figure out ways to fill those rooms and she always did. And, um, oh, I just loved working with her. She was so smart, so savvy, so caring. She loved the business so much. And, um, I just always loved her and I loved, loved, her chopped chicken liver holiday party, which was, there was never anybody else that threw a chopped chicken liver themed holiday party, except for Susan Shulman, and it was great. And it was great chopped chicken liver. I don't know what her secret was, but oof, I loved it. And I'm Unitarian, so I don't really know my chopped chicken liver that well, but whatever. Um, anyway, I'm sending you all love and uh, I'm, my heart is full, and uh, I'm thinking about you. Just adore him. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, me Thank too. You. Ch so, Charles, you want to bring on our first guest? So, yes, this will be a bit of a long introduction, but after Susan and I first did our interview, we continued emailing and calling for a few months. But the next thing we worked on together was in uh, late March of 2021, I realized that on April 6th of 2021, the 50th anniversary of Follies was coming up and it didn't seem like anyone was doing anything for it in terms of panels and things like that. So I decided that since I already knew Susan and also Mary Jane Houdina, who was a dancer in the original production, that perhaps it might be a good idea to try to put together and host a reunion for the 50th anniversary of Follies. And when I mentioned this idea, the first person that Susan put me in contact with was our first guest for this evening. That would be Michael Mesita. And I worked with both Susan and Michael again on a reunion of applause that we did later that year. So Michael, thank you so much for being here. And oh, thank you for having me. I yeah, Hello, I was, Michael. Uh, uh, Susan, I was shocked as well. I think everybody was uh, when I heard about Susan. It just was like the furthest thing from my mind that anything could happen to her. But you know, we became friends on Facebook more than anything. Although I would see her and talk to her at, during applause and at Follies. Uh, but then I didn't see her for years and years and years until I was on Facebook and she contacted me. Said she wanted to get together with an old friend. And we've messengered back and forth quite a bit since then. Uh, I put her, um, her book, which I, I bought and also read several times. And uh, she appreciated my putting it on the site because I, I wrote a whole thing about her as well. Every bit of it true of what an absolute sweetheart she was. And uh, I know during applause, we were trying not to talk to her too much because she was had her hands filled with Lauren Bacall. <laughs> so, uh, but, but uh, it was terrific to get in touch with her from. And this is one of the things I love Facebook about. I can now talk to all the people that I worked with years ago that I'm, I'm not in New York. As you know, I'm in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't really get to see anybody or even see shows that much anymore. But uh, uh, I loved her dearly. I, what a wonderful, wonderful it was. Michael, one thing that you and Susan absolutely share, and it comes through because you're a great writer. Uh, I love your post. Uh, Susan also was a great writer. It comes through her writing and this love that you both share of the theater and your passion for the theater. 
uh, comes through in everything that you write and you share with each other. Uh, we all know what she brought to the table, but from your own uh, your own perspective, what made her a great publicist? The fact that she cared about people. I, I mean, she genuinely cared about her clients. And she always kept a uh, a bit of a separation in that she didn't want herself to be known in particular. All of her attention was placed on clients. And when I would speak with her, even back when I really didn't know her that well in those two in follies and applause, um, uh, you could tell how warm she was. And, I, and that's one of the reasons Betty Bacall not only loved her uh, because she did her job, but loved her, I think, because she could tell she was a caring person. And and uh, that's always come across. Anybody I've ever spoken of about Susan, they feel the same way. Lovely, lovely. Absolutely. Uh, Charles, do you want to bring on our next guest or would you like me to? Well, I would love to, but before I do, I actually want to read a message from another person who wishes they could be here today, but is, I know, watching in on YouTube, and that's uh, Brandon Maggard, another oh, uh, yes, yes. star, and, He's he wanted, yes. and he wanted me to read his quote that during applause, he says, in some ways, she was like Eve Harrington, but only that she was ready, willing, and quite able, <laughs> so I think that's a wonderful quote to describe, Susan, and the next people I'd love to bring on are two college friends of Susan's, Jonathan and Maxine Shine. So thank you both so much for being here with us today. Too. Well, I don't want to say it's a pleasure because it's not, but but, but we feel compelled and love to. We have some funny stories. Um, we were in and NYU in the Bronx together in the Green Room Honor Society and Hall of Fame Players. And Susan and I would try out for shows and end up both of us dancing in all, every show and singing in every show. Um, Jonathan was more often the stage manager. Um, but we got a very good education there. And um, we, as I said, we stayed friendly with Susan. We remember going to her mother's 80th birthday party at Tavern on the Green. Mm. We sat at the children's table because <laughs> mother sat with the 80 year, whatever, 80 year olds. And uh, it was a lot of fun being there. Um, we, we had the pleasure of visiting her in Connecticut at Candlewood Lake and um, seeing, you know, her enjoy her life and her and her work. I don't know. We were both, uh, Maxine lived in the dormitory at NYU, but Susan and I were commuters. So very often, uh, since I had a car, I would drive her home mm -hmm. uh, back to Manhattan, uh, where I live with my parents. And uh, we became very close. Uh, there were a lot of trips back and forth uh, after theater, after, after rehearsing and doing whatever construction or set building, and uh, she was uh, she was really a good friend. Uh, as our professional careers parted, we uh, we didn't see her that much, but we always ex uh, exchanged birthdays and holiday wishes, and and we could always say, "I knew you when." Ah. She and Maxine used to always joke about how they, they, they couldn't possibly be as old as, you know, they, it, it was occurring. Uh, Maxine and Susan graduated in the class of 66, and I was in the class of 65. And uh, we had some really good times together. Uh, but the best was when we went to her mother's 80th birthday and sat at the children's table. Yeah. I love that. One of the things that you just mentioned, you know, uh, friends, uh, being a, a, a longtime friend of Susan's, uh, one of the things that I do know about Susan is that she maintained her friendships with okay. everybody. Uh, everyone I know that started out as a friend with Susan remained a friend throughout her entire life. Uh, when was the last time that you saw each other? Well, as I said, we moved to... Um, 
the Atlanta area 23 years ago. And there were several times when we would come back that we would meet her in New York at one of the lunch places near Times Square. Um, I can't remember now, but it, it's been quite a while though. Since we, we, we did, uh, I said communicate on Facebook and we, you know, birthday cards, New Year's cards, uh, Passover greetings, et cetera, et cetera. But face to face, I can't remember the last time we actually it, it could sat, be 10 had years. lunch with her. It could be easily 10 years. But we never missed a birthday and she never missed a birthday. And, uh, or a holiday, good wishes, et cetera. Yeah. That's wonderful. And even when you were in college with her, did she always want to be a publicist? Did she talk about that? She never talked about that at all. Ah. She was uh, always more interested in in, in acting and, and, and dancing. And, and uh, uh, I don't know how much auditioning she did or because once we graduated, you know, we were, even though we lived in New York at the time and we, we lived in New York for many years, uh, we didn't touch base professionally. Uh, but when we would have lunch or dinner together, she would tell us some stories. One thing I noticed that was never mentioned in any of the public publicity was I think she worked for USA Today at one point or Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. She did way back when, and and I I don't know how thrilled she was with that, but as in you know, <laughs> breaking, breaking in, you had to do what you had to do. So, uh, but she was uh, she was determined yeah. and, and gritty. And one other memory I'd, I'd like to share: after her mother passed away, um, I could tell she was really down and. Um, she wanted to go to Disneyland in Florida. And so I said, I'd go with Disney her. World. Disney World, excuse me. And so we, we went to Disney World and we went all over the place together and had a grand time. And it's fun doing it without children around. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I didn't get to Disneyland in California until I was an adult. And that's the best time to experience it. I agree. But uh, anyway, so that was just the fun thing that we did together. Well, I am thrilled that both of you are here today. So thank you for being here. Uh, stick around, uh, please. Uh, Charles, who would you like to bring on next? Oh, well, before we, before we bring on our next guest, we've got several wonderful messages in the comments that I think we should put on screen. And please, and if there's anyone in the comments who knew Susan has a memory they want to share, we would love to hear it. We have um, a third Hunter High School student here who says they knew Susan since fourth grade. Um, and we have someone, Danny Miller, whose uh, father-in-law play Susan worked on. And now our next guest that I'd love to bring on is someone who's in the Playbill style opening of Susan's book, a client that I know she treasured and a Tony nominee, Kathleen Chalfon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Sorry, you. we both clicked on it at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Kathleen. Welcome to the Hello, show. Thank you. Hello, Charles. So happy to be here. Oh, us too. Well, how did you first meet? Susan Hanford, that, that name wasn't mentioned. Mm. I met I met Susan um, because when I was in Angels in America, my agents thought that I should have a publicist. And they uh, were friends of Susan and they introduced me to Susan. And I tried for a little while to have a publicist, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't take it seriously. Um, but Susan then, uh, that was all right. Susan didn't hold it against me that our professional, uh, or well, sort of our professional uh, uh, association ended because I didn't have a publicist anymore. But you know, the thing is, as Richard said, uh, if Susan was your friend, she was also your publicist. So um, I got uh, the uh, incredible gift of having both Susan's genius as a professional and her the other thing that she had, which was a genius for friendship. And we've been friends. Uh, I'm a new friend, really, because it's only 19, 
1992. But we spent a, a, a great deal of time together. Um, I, we went out always for a birthday lunch. I too am uh, born in 1945. There we have a great cohort of 77 year olds. <laughs> there, there are lots of us. Um, but I, we were usually away on Susan's birthday, so we would uh, go. She get another another uh, birthday lunch. We always had birthday lunch every year as soon as we got back from our trip, and then um, we used to go to Italy. And Susan came uh, to stay with us in Italy and did an amazing thing because, as many people have mentioned, Susan's great uh, culinary triumph was chopped liver. Um, the only thing actually that Susan could cook. But when she was in Italy, she went to cooking a cooking school on the Amalfi Coast and I think had a wonderful time, though no one ever, ever uh, saw the fruits of that <laughs> particular adventure. Um, uh, Kathleen, did she build her parties around her chopped liver? I, I, her parties were her chopped, that was what was offered, chopped liver. And the best part was it was chopped liver from back in the day because it was served on Ritz crackers. Ah. I mean, I think maybe there were, um, as uh, Dr. Oz, who used to be in politics. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you used, used to think so. <laughs> Crudite. 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 Mostly, mostly it was chopped liver. And the other thing, and the thing is that Susan would provide chopped liver for any event that anyone was having. So that we had a Christmas party, we, the Feast of Stephen, the day after Christmas. And we had a, a, a supply of chopped liver for that party too. That's great. <laughs> And when was the last time that you had the chance to speak to Susan? Then I, with along with Leslie Krakauer, who uh, uh, went to high school with Susan, I was um, one of Susan's three healthcare proxies, along with her lawyer Roy Bernstein. And Roy has actually known Susan since uh, she was six and he was five, something like that, because their parents were friends. But any, in any case, Leslie and I were, uh, one or the other of us was with Susan every day um, in the time that she was in the hospital. Um, I didn't see her the day she died because it was the day that the play that I'm doing right now opens, opened. And I, I, that that seems is very like Susan that she would hang on until until the play got opened. Um, we uh, she was in a coma almost the entire time that she was in the hospital, but we both talked to her and told her I think that she was a person who didn't understand that she lived in a sea of friends. And so we were able to tell her about the people who loved her and um, express that love. Excuse me for interrupting, uh, but that, that comment that you just made, was that something that she always felt? Or towards the end, was this something she felt? I don't know, but I think I have a feeling that she didn't know how deeply she was loved and how much mm -hmm. she meant to how many people. That saddens me. But thank you so much for, for sharing that and for being so open and honest about it. Absolutely. And Richard, would you like to bring on? Uh, yes, I think I would like to bring on uh, Deb Weiner. Uh, hi. Hi. How are you? hi, everybody. Hi, Kathy. Hey, Deb. Hi, and uh, thank you, uh, Richard and Charles, for, for including me. Yeah, it's, I'm sitting here with rapt attention listening to what everybody's saying, and I 
I agree. I, I was so fortunate to be in Susan's very inner circle. Um, I was not uh, able to be a Kathy and Leslie took care of Susan in the hospital, but, but, and were so gracious about giving us these daily reports of what was happening because the truth of the matter is, and it was in the press, it's not uh, telling tales that she contracted Legionnaire's disease. And if I, if I understand correctly, nobody's quite sure why. And nope. it's and it's a crazy, crazy freak of a thing. She had a, an underlying um, a weakness in immunity for a different reason. She was doing fantastically well, and um, and this was just a freak thing. But I I agree with Kathy, um, and I often often because Susan made our lives better. She was the warmest, most wonderful, most loyal friend. You, she, and and what Kathy said about um, if she was your friend, she was also your publicist. So I know that um, whether you know for for those of us, and I got to have her for Thanksgiving. That was my greatest. Um, I, it was such a joy. Susan was mine for Thanksgiving and was such a part of the family. But I also observed that for some reason, and I think it was always. I don't think it was lately. I think there was just something about her. Um, she was not an only child, but she seemed like an only child somehow. And I think, and she was very, very devoted to her mom. And I remember, um, I think Maxine mentioned how down she was when her mom passed. Um, she was bereft. I think they were dear, dear pals. And I think that we all loved her so much. Um, but I don't think that she quite understood the depth of how much she was loved. I think she knew she had friends and she knew she could count on people, but I think there was always a little bit of a nagging thing there. And um, on a, on a, on a funnier note, it's so true about the chopped liver parties. I think uh, she had candy, chopped liver, and there was candy. Um, so, the, and the Ritz crackers and, and she would bring, and I, I will always, you know, in the before times would always have a Christmas party every year and shove as many people in my little apartment as um, all loving, fun, interesting people. Mm -hmm. And it was the one day a year, really, except maybe for Thanksgiving. I just, I cooked my brains out for that party. I just cooked my brains out for days and, you know, had all this kind of stuff. And then Susan would bring some chopped liver. And I swear to God, if one more person came up to me and said, oh my God, that is fabulous. And that's all they would talk about. So, but um, yeah, she, it was the, um, if you were trying to remember the name of the coffee shop, it was the Edison coffee shop that she loved, the Polish tea room. And uh, she would order a grilled cheese with matzo ball soup with no noodles. Noodles for some reason freaked her out. I don't understand why. And then, <laughs> and then when she, uh, when that closed, um, she would, we would go to the Westway diner if we were, I mean, again, before the pandemic. Um, and she was the first person I ate outdoors with when, when things slightly opened up at this wow. little restaurant in her neighborhood in the West day eighties uh, called Bella Luna. And they had, they had tables outside and, and hermetically sealed silverware and, you know, and all of that. And she was the first person I actually ventured out with because she was very careful about COVID. Deb, do you remember how you met? Yes, exactly. I met because my best friend uh, in the world uh, is Karen Ziemba. Oh. And, uh, and Karen was in contact at the time in the around 2000. And Karen... Uh, and it, it was a very wonderful company of very loving people. But the, 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 the hard fact of the matter is in publicity world that Karen got all the reviews and all the awards. And they had a lovely young woman, uh, which in the show was the girl in the yellow dress. And the girl in the yellow dress was running away with all the publicity because she was posing for Vogue and she was posing for this. And it was so distressing to me that I browbeat Karen. And it's amazing. We're still friends. Uh, <laughs> I browbeat Karen into saying, you need somebody professional to manage this thing. She was nominated for a Tony. She won or was nominated for a jillion other awards for that. And I said, you need somebody to manage this. These things don't just kind of manage themselves. 
And um, the wonderful Bert Fink, who was at Rogers and Hammerstein organization, a lovely, wonderful pillar of the musical theater community. He was friends with Susan and suggested her. And, uh, and it was just love at first sight. We became what Susan called the Z team. And so from then on, whenever Karen was doing something uh, and had to be, you know, presented for, you know, this show or that show, whatever, she would retain Susan. And, um, and we all, my sister Jess and Karen and I were like the three sisters and we all pitched in and we went looking for clothes for what gown to wear and what interviews to do and figuring out all this stuff. And Kathy, you probably, and then, and then, you know, so we all became good friends. And then when I needed things, um, just try and even keep Susan from <laughs> helping me, right? You know, she was, I, I, I was artistic director at the Y for the, uh, for their American songbook series for a decade. And, uh, and I, I'd asked Susan for advice, this and that, but then after I left the Y, I kind of was, had a lot of opportunities to do things under my own, uh, flag. And Susan jumped in like she was my manager and she kind of acted like my manager too. She was like, let's evaluate this. Let's figure out that whatever project it was. And um, like Kathy said, whether or not you were formally retaining her for money, which from her dear friends, she wouldn't take. Mm -hmm. um, she, um, she was just right in there doing everything. And she was at this new series at Jazz at Lincoln Center and she was, you know, absolutely just managing all of it. And then the last time I spoke to her was right after the sh last show that we had there on Duke Ellington on September 11th. She did everything for the show. She was dealing with reviews and stuff like that afterwards. We spoke on, I think, Tuesday. And I think she went to the hospital Wednesday, if I remember. Something Thursday, like that. Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. Okay. So then we spoke Wednesday. And, um, you know, because she said, what should I do about this person? What, you know, and so, um, yeah, she was just uh, uh, unstoppable and she loved and cherished the business. I know. She was I she know. was so proud uh, to be with this community that was her family in the general sense, as well as those of us specifically who were family. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. Uh, Charles? The ball in your card. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I did want to mention too when we did our interview. One of the last questions that I got to ask her was, "What are you working on next, and what are you looking forward to doing?" And the main thing that she talked about was your concert series and how excited she was to be doing that, uh, and how much she was looking forward to that. So thank that's you so dear. Thank you for thank you for sharing that with me. And we have um, three more special guests with us today, but we have only one more of Susan's clients with us. And so I'd like to bring her on, the, um, the great cabaret singer, Anna Bergman. Thank you for joining us today, Anna. Hello, uh, Anna. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. I'm in Alexandria, Virginia, <laughs> sitting at my piano. So, um, Susan, I, you know, it's so wonderful to hear all these stories because um, my connection with her goes back to the early 2000s when I made my cabaret debut in New York um, at Danny's Skylight Room. At, uh, mm -hmm. It was my first uh, venture into cabaret and the show was called Souvenir and with Alex Rybeck and directing was um, Sarah Louise Lazarus. And um, Susan was my very first press agent and she was, as is saying so passionate absolutely excellent she worked so hard and she just nailed it she and and I was really struck also by how honest she was really honest and always appreciated that and very strong and incredibly caring as everyone's sharing now and um I, I want to say that one of the things that I find so beautiful about these celebrations of someone's life is that um, something magical happens, which is um, those of us who love her can reconnect. And so when Charles and Richard asked me to do this, I said, can I reach out to two of my dear colleagues and buddies, Jason Graw and, um, and Ron Raines? 
and because I knew that they were also clients of, um, of Susan. And of course you saw that adorable um, video from, uh, from Jason. Um, but just spending all of last night for like an hour and a half between Ron and, and Jason, just texting, emailing, sharing photos, um, just reminiscing about our gigs that we had together. I just felt this is such a beautiful gift that Susan is giving us because um, as Deborah knows, I think the last time I saw them was both of them, because Deborah was with me there too, was at Clea Blackhurst's wedding. But, you know, <clears throat> we all get, you know, here's Ron doing his thing and in New York and I'm doing my thing in Virginia and, and Jason's doing Brigadoon today in, uh, in LA. And I just, um, I thought to myself, this is such a beautiful gift that she's giving us to all reconnect like this. And I think it's intentional. I really do. I don't think it's just a coincidence or happenstance. So um, I'm going to read to you what Ron said, what he wrote me last night. Ron Rain said, Susan was a superb press agent. She worked so hard for her clients. I was so shocked to hear that she had passed and I wasn't aware that she had been sick. I'm so sad. So, and I and I share that feeling too. I know some of us are expressing that. I also didn't know that she was sick, and um, I didn't know that she had passed. So I'm I'm just glad, just grateful, also to hear about um, your experiences um, helping her through Kathleen and and Deborah helping her through in such a loving and committed and devoted way in those final days, and making her feel so loved. And I just want to also just sing a little something quickly <laughs> for her. You're nearer mm -hmm. than my is to my pillow, nearer than the wind is to the willow, dearer than the rain is. To the earth below, precious as the sun, to the things that grow, you're nearer than the ivy to the wall is, nearer than the winter to the fall is, leave me. But when you're away, you'll know you're nearer, for I love you so. Stay near. We love you, Susan. Oh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And um, Anna was gracious enough to join us before her show this afternoon, so let's all wish her good luck on that as well. And and thank you for for being here. Anna, uh, have a great show tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Love to you all. Thank, thank you. you. I would love to show um, two more comments before we bring on our next guest. This is another um, classmate of Susan's from Hunter, and it's so great that you're all. Yeah. Here today and thank you all for being here oh yes and next i would love to bring on someone who talked about i know susan's holiday parties that was the first thing that he said when he saw the um the announcement of her death and and shared that wonderful story so here's michael portantier thank you for being here michael hey, michael hi hi yeah i mean um those parties were amazing for several reasons first of all the chicken liver itself was so delicious. I mean, as I, I think, uh, obviously that that's a legacy <laughs> that uh, that Susan left one of one of her legacies. Um, but also, for many years, her office was in the uh, well, what used to be called the Paramount Building, fifteen oh one Broadway, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that in, that was great in itself because that's such a old time showbiz place. Of course, it was the literally the building where uh, Frank Sinatra created a sensation and 
1940 or whenever that was uh, when the Paramount Theater used to be functioning. So that was another wonderful thing about the party. But most of all, it was Susan's company and the the wonderful company that she kept. Um, I loved seeing uh, Kathleen there every year and getting to talk with her. Uh, it, it was wonderful. Uh, Susan, um, it's been alluded to, but I think another of her talents was as a matchmaker. And I don't, and I don't mean romantically, although she may have done that as well. I, I really don't know. But putting people together who would really be very simpatico. I remember she uh, called me when uh, this uh, fellow named Giuseppe Basilio uh, was going to be appearing uh, in an off-Broadway production of the play of Spring Awakening uh, in the role of Melchior in the, in the title role, the, 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 the central role. And he was only 15 at the time, uh, but he had already been Billy Elliot on Broadway, uh, playing the role of Billy Elliot. He was one of the many uh, towards the end of the run. And, uh, but that was his only real credit at that point. Uh, but I think Susan knew that he was going to really be something. And so uh, she had the, we had the interview in her office uh, in, 1501 Broadway, and because Giuseppe was so young, uh, G uh, Susan herself was there, and also Giuseppe's mother, and it was a really good interview, and we actually have remained friends uh, all these years, and since that time, uh, Giuseppe, although he's now still only 25, has been in seven Broadway shows, yes. uh, including Hello, Dolly! with Bette Midler, and most recently Hamilton, and um, Aladdin and Newsies and blah, 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 blah. So that, I really think that um, Susan prided herself on putting people together like that. And and not too long ago, I thanked her uh, for uh, specifically for putting me together with Giuseppe and his mother. And she said, uh, she wrote back, I knew you would like them. I think, I think she really, it really made her happy uh, for me to tell her that we had remained in touch and, and had become very close friends. Um, recently, I've been rereading Susan's amazing book, which honestly I, I had not read since it came out. And honestly, I never even got the, um, I never got the revised version. So that's something I'm going to have to pick up. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what's in that that's not in the original, uh, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's a really great book. Here's a blurb from Kathleen Chalfant. Uh, this wonderful memoir will make you feel like you were there. Susan is the insider's insider. Buy it, read it, you will love it. I, I completely, totally agree. It's, um, it's an amazing book. Uh, Susan, uh, one of her other talents, I, I would say, is she had a knack of being able to get along with people who were generally considered quite difficult. And I guess that would include, for example, uh, Lauren Bacall and George C. Scott and also uh, uh, Yul Brynner. And they, they were very good friends uh, based on a, a, quite an early interaction. Uh, and it takes really someone special, I think, to, uh, to be able to do that. So that, that's something that deserves to be said about Susan. Uh, but also I always love the fact that she could be, uh, she could be very, very honest. Um, uh, press agents, um, part of their job is not to necessarily be so honest, uh, <laughs> but she had, she had a good uh, talent for getting around that. Uh, I'm sure it, what, it, at the time that it happened, this was not very pleasant or or hilarious, but what she wrote about uh, her experience as the press agent for the Broadway show Dream, and specifically about the behavior of Leslie Ann Warren. Um, if you read it now in retrospect, it's quite uh, interesting and, and kind of hilarious. For example, um, there was this really bad behavior happening and Susan said that one day Michael Riedel from the Post called her up and said, Susan, is it true that Leslie destroyed a prop at rehearsal? And Susan's response was, oh, Michael, it must be a very slow news day. <laughs> didn't say yes, she didn't say no, she didn't say maybe, she said it must be a very slow news day. <laughs> and then um, another time after that, uh, Michael called up uh, Susan and said, um, 
Susan, is it correct that Leslie threw a chair at one of the producers during the rehearsal? And she said, oh, Michael, there you go again. <laughs> so that, that was Susan, you know, she, she was really good at that. Uh, I don't think she, I, I don't think she ever lied. Uh, not in my experience. And, and sometimes it's hard to be a press agent and not lie and not at least bend the truth a lot. So I really, really loved her and I, I'm so shocked. I was as shocked as most of you uh, to hear uh, of her passing because I did not know that she was ill at all. Okay. And she really, she really leaves a, a great void and I will always think of her very, very fondly. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you for sharing those. Charles, do you mind if I bring on our next guest? No, not at all. I am so excited that she finally got here. <laughs> uh, because uh, she, Susan uh, reached out to me uh, this past year uh, and to you as well uh, to have her on both of our shows. Yes. Uh, and what a great pleasure it was because I fell in love with her. Uh, when I saw her in the revival of Brigadoon. And here she is. And I just saw her recently in your amazing show uh, at uh, 54 Below. Thank and you. she brought the house down. Uh, and I'm thrilled that she's here, uh, Meg Buzzard. So I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And thanks for hanging in there, because I know you were probably having a little technical difficulties to get here. Well, I got on the listening link. So I've been here the whole time, but, um, but, now <laughs> but you're on. here now. So thank you for joining us. So Susan and I go way back. Um, I started um, in the chorus uh, and then in the chorus, I started getting understudies. And then I met a couple of uh, casting people, namely Julie who's in Barry Moss and they were wonderful. Uh, they brought me in for everything and I started getting roles. And um, uh, at one point, um, you know, uh, it was Barry and then it was Julie. Uh, Meg, you, you've got to get someone to, to help you with this. You've got to get a publicity person. And I said, but the show has a publicity person. And they said, yeah, you need one. And I go, okay. So they introduced me or they gave me Susan. Um, Susan and I hit it off just amazingly. Um, I was um, in the course of applause in the National with Leroy all, you know, and, and Madam. Betty, and um, um, then uh, um, my first, well, anyway, I ended up uh, as uh, in the Music Man with Dick Van Dyke playing Marion, and that's what started getting me some attention. Um, uh, anyway, uh, yes, Brigadoon, so Brigadoon happened, and I decided at that point, yeah, I needed someone to speak for me, and Susan was remarkable, and one of the most fun things she did was um, I got a nice review from um, from Frank Rich, was a really nice thing to get. Um, in Music Man, the review that I got from, um, I think it was John Simon, was just wonderful. And then when I opened five months later in Brigadoon Revival, he said I was old and shrill. <laughs> um, uh, but then the, uh, the Frank Rich review was really wonderful. And, I, and she took that and uh, sent a couple of, um, you know, publicity shots to Al Hirschfeld. And um, uh, lo and behold, um, I was highlighted on one of the Friday uh, New York Times chatter things that they would they would have on Fridays. And so that meant <laughs> there would be a Hirschfeld of me, just me. And um, I have that. I actually purchased it as well. And that was, that was all Susan. Um, she was really a, an amazing person. A couple times as we went along, I didn't have enough money for her. And uh, she just, she said, okay, two weeks, two weeks. And then the two weeks that I paid her turned out to be six weeks of work for her. And that was remarkable. So when I became a professor and started teaching um, at NYU, one of the courses that I taught was professions of the theater. So it was in a music degree and lo and behold, the young people at 17 or 18 don't know that theater is about many things other than being on stage with the spotlight. So uh, we bring in all sorts of different people and, and I would always bring Susan in and they, the, the young folks naturally stunned at uh, how much work it is to publicize um, a show and how much work it is to isolate a particular performer and help them along in their career. So she was a very marvelous addition to my teaching and she was great. 
um, over the years, we, we you know, co connected with each other pretty much like every year. And then the last six years, it was, it was closer. I would go up to Connecticut um, several times over the summer and spend a day or two with her. Certainly when COVID happened, we didn't do that as much. I would sometimes just go up for the day. Uh, and um, But I did know she was, was having some issues. I didn't know what had happened. Uh, when I did your show, Charles, um, I, I contacted her beforehand. I said, you know, you're going to be there because that was, I knew everybody in that show and it was so much fun, you know, and way a lot it played with Richard. I used him in the audience. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, you know, so it was, she said, no, I, I just, you know, I'm kind of staying by myself a little, didn't really, you know, let on. I knew there was something, but I didn't know what. Um, so yeah, I saw her, um, I saw what happened from, from, you know, what I read from both Richard and Charles. And it was, um, it's very sad. She had such passion. And I think that's the thing that we're all, we all keep coming to. And then those of us who've been on stage, you're not there alone. You're never there alone. And um, there, I would take into my classroom uh, a playbill and I would say, look at all the names, <laughs> look at the class list and then look at all the names. And they would go, <gasps> so um, we all know when we're standing there, what's behind us. And um, she was one of those people and one of the best of those kinds of people and uh, a supporter that you could call years later and she would just oh what are you doing oh how can i help well let me look at your website you know i mean she just a very very special person so i'm glad i found this link and i'm glad you guys are letting me share this because she was i am too i'm so happy. thrilled that you got here so thank you thank, thank you, you so much thank you I think this um, this goes back to Michael's idea too of her being a great matchmaker that she knew that both Richard and I would have such a great time interviewing you <laughs> and making that connection. She reached out to both of us at the same time and so I'm, I'm thrilled that she did for both of us. Um, we have one other guest that's been waiting so patiently in the wings and I think uh, that this is one of uh, Susan's oldest friends. Uh, Janice, are you still there? I uh, I know that we're going to see uh, Janice. Are you there? Yeah, I am actually here, but I'm not. I'm actually not feeling well. But I will say hello. Well, thank, thank you for you. thank you for hanging in there. Uh, right. I'm sorry that you're not feeling well. No, uh, no, it's okay. Let me just say though that I known Susan for a couple of years now. I met her down here at Candlewood Lake, and. Um, I actually had lived on the Upper West Side for 33 years, but didn't know her then. Uh, and then I moved, I bought a house up here in Candlewood Lake and then moved up here permanently during COVID. But I what became fast friends with Susan, uh, sitting at the lake and, and going out to dinner with her and, and doing laps, like I had mentioned before. In that gorgeous lake behind you. Yeah, Candlewood Lake. And... Um, you know, I she was my main friend up here, so it's really, really sad for me. And um, she would, you know, she was one person that, and she always said to me, you know, oh, in a certain way, she doesn't feel like super accepted up there. And I said, don't be the Lone Ranger. I don't feel that way either. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I do like, I do like it here. And you know, it's like, I, I just always enjoyed the time sitting with Susan because she. First off, had a million stories. You know, I did a little bit of Broadway things myself. I was a dresser on Broadway for The Phantom and for Les Mis. So I enjoyed, you know, reading Sue's book and hearing all her stories and um, getting her suggestions on plays or, you know, what was what she felt was good to see on Broadway. Um, and, I mean, look, how could you not enjoy being with her and... Also, her neighbors, you know, that lived right adjacent to her, TJ, um, walk by my house every morning and I say, oh, you know, hi. I don't even know TJ, but now we know each other through Susan because I'm always like, I miss Susan. And he goes, I miss Susan. And he goes, she used to come every day to my house when she pulled up in her car and stop in and just chit chat. And, you know, it was I look down my driveway. I always look for the little red car you know, tooting by because she would always stop and, you know, wave and then get out. What can I do for you? You know, it's just, 
it's hard to describe in words, you know, a relationship with somebody, but it really, you know, I keep telling people, I, this one friend, this really good friend at the lake, no one really understands. But um, it was important to me because to really find someone that I could connect with. And I'm not saying that many of the people here on the lake aren't nice because they are, and they're very helpful. But to have someone that, you know, I felt like I could relate to on a lot of different levels, um, I felt was rare. And I could also say to Susan, you want to go out and get something to eat? And she would always say, yes, let's go to dinner. And she would always pick the same place. And I was always telling her I didn't like it. And then she said, she would say, <laughs> she would say, oh, but it's fine. It's just a regular, regular, ordinary meal. And I said, um, Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I don't like, and I'm gonna keep going to that restaurant with Susan, even though I wanted with Susan, but I didn't like the food. This huh. is it's kind of a silly story, and I didn't know if you wanted to hear my stories because I'm they're not related so much to the press world that you all are talking about. But these little things are important to me, and it turns out that Susan, uh, at the last couple of days, you know last over the summer she goes will you go to dinner with me and I said absolutely and she goes I'm going to go wherever you want I'm mm -hmm. going to go to whatever restaurant you want to go to and um and I, I just thought that was so sweet I said Susan you don't have to do that and um and I did see Susan right up to the very end because she came to the um Candlewood uh picnic we sat with her I had some friends from the Upper West Side there, and Susan talked the whole time about all her connections with her mother and the school, and it turns out my friend from the Upper West Side uh, went to her mother, and her mother both had connections in the same school and all the way through, and that Susan went to school where my friend went to school, and it turns out it's a small world. And Susan always knows how to connect other people with other people and all the stories from the past. And so that's my little Candlewood Bista story about Susan. Well, thank you for sharing those. Um, um, we are towards the end of our show. What I'd like to do is I would like to share my closing remarks. And then I'm going to turn it over to you, Deb. Everybody's going to have a chance to give your closing remarks. It can be about anything that we've talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with today. Uh, and then you'll pick the next person that you would like to speak. And then, Charles, I want you to have the final word today, uh, since this was your brainchild to have this happen today. Um, I... Uh, in thinking uh, about uh, a poem that uh, I think it's called In the Next Room, uh, I when I was at uh, Carol Channing's memorial, uh, Time Daily read this incredible poem about thinking of those that have passed on as being in the next room. Uh, even though we can't physically see them, let's always think about them as being in the next room. And I think it's a wonderful way of thinking of Susan she is very much in our hearts and our minds. Uh, hearing these stories today from all of you, uh, I can taste that uh, chicken liver and I uh, <laughs> hear these stories and, uh, you know, and even, you know, imagine myself at the lake, uh, even though I've never been there, uh, through hearing these stories. And it's important that we continue to tell these stories. And I do believe firmly that as long as we continue to tell these stories, as long as her book is read, as long as we share these stories that her that she is still with us. And it's important that we keep her memory alive uh, because she's left such an incredible legacy. Uh, I wanna thank everybody that appeared on today's show. And Anna, thank you for being here. Uh, for those who were not able to be here as well, and for those of you who uh, tuned in to watch today, uh, this show will be available uh, forever. Uh, and you can also go back and see Charles's two-part interview. And I also had the good pleasure of celebrating Susan on the show earlier, and she's there as well. Um, I 
end every show, this is not just for today, but those of you who follow me and know this, uh, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. I say that at the end of every single show that I do. I also tell everyone uh, to reach out to someone that you haven't spoken to in a while. Uh, the week that Susan uh, passed away, uh, Jenna Robbins, another dear friend, her mother passed away that week at 100. Uh, my director for my last show passed away the same week. Uh, I, it was every, it seemed like every time I would go to Facebook, uh, out of the blue, there would be this announcement that someone had passed away. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to the opening night of Hello Dolly because of a Facebook friend who, want, through her generosity, wanted me to go with her. And I got a birthday announcement and I wanted to reach her, uh, wish her a happy birthday and only to find out that she had passed away six months ago and I didn't know this. So it's very important that we take the time to reach out to someone that you haven't spoken to in a while. It's important that we do that with always. So my wish for everybody that's on the panel today and for everyone who's watching and everyone who will hear this, go into your database, reach out to someone you haven't spoken to in a while and reach out just to say, you matter in my life. You're important to me. It's important that we do that every single day of our lives. I've always ended every show. I have a dear friend, Sean Moniger, and he always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. But I saw something the other day and it says, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different size boats. Some of us are in yachts. Some of us are in row boats. Some of us are in dinghies. Some of us in rafts. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're in. If you're going to go out in that boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So <laughs> on that note, I'm going to leave the screen. And Deb, I'm going to turn it over to you. And when you finish, you will pick the next person. And everyone, let's just stay connected with each other because we all are in this together. I love you all. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. Deb, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, well, Richard, thank you. Uh, and, and I should say Richard is a very, very... Um, he has speaks with such passion because he's really one to be terrific at getting people together and keeping people together. And so riffing on that and thinking about the fact that Thanksgiving is a week from Thursday and I will be facing a table for the first time in many years without Susan at it. Um, I will go not to contradict either the poet or Tyne Daly, but I think that I like to think even more than being in the next room that people who are no longer here with us are here with us, we just talk to them in a different way. And, um, and so their presence is with us and we can, we can converse with them and they can advise us. It's just the mode of communication is a little bit different than what we're used to. And I think that mm -hmm. Susan uh, really, several people touched on it in different ways. Susan really embodies somebody who, who understands to every cell in their being what a community we are in this art form and that it is made up by many people doing many things, but we all are um, a family in some way, shape or form. And there's ornery members of that family and there's people that perhaps you don't need to see all the time, but, but the way our business is glued together with all the different uh, jobs that different people have and yet somehow it all has to magically come together and everybody has to respect everybody else's expertise, but there's, it's not a top-down hierarchy like apparently it is in the real world. Um, <laughs> Susan, Susan, uh, really embodied that she loved this business. She loved the community. She really got the way all of this works together. And I think it's what makes the people and the way we know how to collaborate, I think is what makes us truly more special and more blessed than any other kind of community in, in whether it's elsewhere in the arts or whether it's in whatever that real world is out there, um, that we are very special. And 
Uh, and it's because of exactly what Susan represents. Um, and I'm going to, I love, I'm Michael, you're such an old friend. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy because Kathy, um, uh, Kathy was really on the front lines during those uh, that last month. And again, I want to make it clear to people who don't know, Susan did not live in an ill way. She was fine. She was dealing with a health issue that, that lowered her immunity, but her lifestyle, and she was a perfectly, in, in terms of experience, she lived perfectly healthily except for the last four weeks or so. Uh, when she suddenly became ill. So if anybody is under the mistaken impression that she was living with illness in a, in a way that, um, that was uh, detrimental to her, uh, her life, that, that's in a, in a blessed way, that wasn't the case. So I'm gonna turn it over to the angel who cared for her in those last four weeks, Kathy. Thank you, Deb. Um, there were lots of angels, lots of angels there. Um, Leslie, the the three of us who were uh, Susan's healthcare proxies were only knew each other glancingly, if at all. But um, in Susan's uh, last act of connection, made um, a community of the three of us. We called ourselves the Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. It was a privilege to um, look after Susan. She was wonderfully looked after. Everybody should know by the people in the ICU at Mount Sinai. And I just want to say one wonderful thing happened. Um, on the Saturday, not the, I think it wasn't the Saturday before she died, it was the Saturday before that, Brian Stokes Mitchell came and spent an hour with her and sang to her. And they say that you can hear. So I believe that to be true. It was a great gift from Stokes to a person who only gave gifts to the rest of us. Uh, and I will pass this on to Michael. There we have two Michaels, to the, the Hawaiian Michael, I will pass it on. To you. Oh. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thank you, Richard. Always a pleasure to be with the two of you, and I'm, I'm very honored to be, have been invited today. And thank you, everyone, for your wonderful stories. Um, I'll sum it all up with this. Susan was a doll. She was a sweetheart and a good friend, and my life is much better for having her in it. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. And who would you like to turn it over to? The other Michael. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware that there's a new Broadway museum about to open. And I'm going to a press preview of it tomorrow. And as it happens, I'm going with the aforementioned Giuseppe Basilio, whom I would never have met if it wasn't for Susan. Uh, so I'm sure we're both going to be thinking of her as we go through the museum, uh, because aside from everything else, uh, Susan, of course, was was very uh, much into the history and the traditions of Broadway. And I think her book is a is and was a, a wonderful contribution to that history, really from a perspective that we don't often hear, that of the press agent. So I'm glad that she decided to write that book. And I'm glad that it was popular enough that um, there was a second edition not long after the first one. And as I said, I really do have to pick up that, uh, that, that second edition because I never did get it. And I've been prompted to with all these reminiscences. Um, so that's my comment. And I guess I would like to turn over to Meg Busser. It's hard to follow a lot of these last thoughts. Um, I think we share so many of them. He was a remarkable person. I am glad I found the link. I am so glad and appreciative of being here and hearing all of your stories and comparing it with what I knew of her and what I shared with her. And special, special thank you to Richard and Charles um, for, for what you guys have brought together here and brought us all together. So I'm done. Thank you. 
I would like to talk to Jonathan and Maxine. Okay. Um, we don't have much to add, but again, I, as was said, Charles, thank you so much for putting it on Facebook so that Jonathan was able to see and we were able to be part of this group. Susan was a big part of our lives. And uh, at my age, you don't expect to lose friends quite yet, especially if they don't have illnesses. So we're glad that we could find out more about what happened. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you both for, for being here today. And I'd like to... um. To finally close by really thanking everyone who's here today it's such a been such a beautiful tribute and it's a tribute that she had so many friends who loved her so much that they were willing to be here and do this today i'd like to close with two things first a um a final message from someone who wished they could have been here today uh donna mckechnie who wrote um thank you for honoring her this way she was a wonderful person as well as a wonderful professional and my very best to you and everyone here and the final thing I'd like to talk about is this gift that I have from Susan Schulman that I'm about to show everyone that she gave me so many gifts in so many ways, but this is a, a physical one that I'll be able to treasure forever. And I got an email from her during the height of the pandemic in around November or December saying, what's your address? And she said, I have something for you. And she actually drove by my apartment and dropped this off in the lobby. And it is this wonderful Playbill wrapping paper that you see here that I've used many times on many different gifts. And just like Susan was a gift to so many of us, this was a wonderful gift as well. So thank you all. Thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you, Richard, for co-hosting this with me. And have a wonderful day. <laughs>